cool. Awesome. So I just started recording. So, hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, this is Mark with Limo Marketer. And I'm joined uh, by Jennifer from A Touch of Class Limousine out of uh, Frederick, Maryland. Uh, Jennifer, just wanted to thank you for doing this. Sure. Thanks for having me, Mark. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so for those uh, that don't know you, I know you're in the Facebook group and you participate a decent amount. You ask questions, um, you know, in limo growth. So I'm sure people have seen you around. Can you give everyone, um, you know, uh, just a little background on how, how you got into uh, the industry and a, a little bit about your business? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I bought a pre-existing limo company about 13 years ago. I was in the accounting field, um, worked at a public accounting office, just had had a child and was looking for something with flexibility. I was actually in a BNI group for my husband's business. He owns a window tinting and detailing company. And the owner of A Touch of Class Limousines at that time was a member of the BNI group and announced to the group that he was interested in selling. Uh, went home, told my husband and thought, hmm, this could be a great way to kind of be a stay-at-home mom, but still have something gratifying. And, you know, it's just kind of grown from there. Nice. Okay. So that was 13 years ago. And so how, how large, how many vehicles uh, did the business have at, at that point? It had seven vehicles. So at that point we had one sedan, we had one SUV and then the rest limos. Got it. Got it. And so the whole reason you got in to the business was you, you were looking for a little more flexibility because were you, did you have your own like accounting business at the time or I were was, you an employee? I was an employee. I worked in a public accounting firm in Montgomery County, which is kind of just like right out of the side of DC, um, had an hour long commute, you know, each way, every day. I was the only female there and the men were spending the night during tax season. And I didn't want to spend the night <laughs> during tax season. You know, I wanted to be home with my daughter and my family. And as much as I loved it and still do love, you know, the numbers side of things, this was just a much better fit for, you know, having a young child that you wanted to take to and from school every day and, you know, be around a little bit more during the summer. Awesome. So was this the first business that you ever owned? Did you ever have anything like, I don't know, a side business in college or was well, we actually bought, um, I've been married 22 years now. So on the day we came home from our honeymoon, we actually bought a window tinting and detailing company. So I had the experience of that. You know, we had been doing that for like nine years and it really was a good fit. When I bought the limo company, they were just running out of kind of like a satellite office that they rented every month. So they didn't really have a place. So it was great because we just kind of moved everything into you know, the buildings that we already had for the tint and detail company. So it was a really good mesh with what, you know, uh, we already had going. Got it. Yeah. Really a good symbiotic relationship there. And yep. so I know you don't actually, uh, you've got, um, where you guys do like your sales. I actually went out and visited you, um, in your office. That was really cool. Um, it's, um, your vehicles are in a separate location. Is that, is that correct? Correct. So we still have, um, our vehicles are at the same location where the tint and detail shop is. Okay. And that's where my office was for probably eight years. So, you know, where the chauffeurs come and pick up the vehicles, that's where I sat every day. And I found myself spending more time dealing with the chaos of chauffeurs wanting to talk about this and gossip about that than actually spend it on growing my business. So we all of the office staff moved out into like you saw i mean we're just in a traditional office um you know no vehicles around and once i did that i probably almost doubled the limo company because i was able to concentrate solely on sales versus concentrating on you know the people walking in and out that wanted to chit chat and gossip and all that awesome yeah so this is something i kind of want to point out that she just said that I think so many times operators, they get caught up in the actual running of the business and they forget that really for growing, all that matters is sales, right? And so, so that, that's huge. That's really cool. And um, yeah, it's so weird because when I went into your office, you know, it's like, I'm like, oh, this is like a limo company. 
And uh, how, how far are you? You're, you're a little ways from where you house all your vehicles, is that right? Right, yeah. So the, um, the limo garage is in Frederick, which that's where my husband is today. Where our actual limo offices, we do have a second location. It's in McHenry, Maryland. So about a two hour, about a two hour difference. Um, so my husband still commutes back and forth almost every day. He spends the night on occasion. Wow. But, you know, so he's there, I'm, you know, in the sales office. Got it. And that probably gives you a lot more, like, time because you don't have to spend it commuting because you live relatively close to your office now. Is that, right. is that correct? Yeah, like 10 minutes. Awesome. Okay, cool. And so you guys, um, what sort of um, – what sort of clients do you primarily focus on? Are you more, and I know this, but for everyone else, are you more like of a retail, like proms, weddings, night outs? Do you do much corporate and airport work? What would you say is the mix? Well, I mean, we primarily, I say we're a special events company more than anything. Um, weddings definitely being our number one business. Um, proms, birthdays, things like that. Um, I mean, we do corporate work. We do airport transportation um you know i'd say corporate airport like all encompass maybe 25 percent, and then the okay. other 75 percent is special events okay got it and so you know in the past um so when was it that you said you said you doubled in size when did you move from that how long ago was that so i moved my office um it's been about five years okay since I moved and you know it definitely it definitely has some downsides to it but as far as just being able to concentrate solely on you know sales it's been amazing nice nice um, and so what are what are you guys doing right now like in terms of um, in terms of marketing are you using Yelp um, are you doing SEO what are the different um, obviously we work together <laughs> right. Well, and I guess it's probably been about two years since you and I have been working together. And I mean, that's where 90% of my advertising dollars for the most part go into, you know, what you do for me, which is fantastic. Um, other than that, I mean, we still do wedding shows, um, you know, still do some local community things, you know, more just to stay involved than anything. But, you know, the Google marketing that we do with you is definitely, you know, our number one and it's how we're growing right now. Um, you know, we're still, we get a lot of repeat business. Um, we have relationships with a lot of wedding venues and um, wedding planners, things of that nature. But as far as the bulk of our new business, it's really coming from what you and I are doing together. Okay, cool. And so I remember when we first started working together two years ago, you're kind of trying to figure out like the best kind of, sales process and, and how to really work things because I think you went from, you know, you probably got had a pretty big jump in like the number of leads you're getting a day. And so can you walk me through kind of what you do? And this is really the main reason I wanted to interview you because out of the over 90 companies I work with, I would say you're in the top probably 3% as far as like your sales process and knowing your numbers, uh, which makes sense because you used to be an accountant and that's what you do. You track everything. Right. Um, can you, can you walk me through kind of what you guys, uh, you know, what your sales process looks like? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think probably introducing your product was when it became even more important to track everything. When you and I first started working together, it was a per lead. Thing. So I knew exactly how much I was paying per phone call, per email. And it was so important to make sure that I was getting the maximum that I could out of every single phone call or every single email. Because if not, I felt like I was losing out. I just spent this money. I wasn't following through with it. So I think that really kind of kicked me into high gear as far as, you know, every single phone call, every single email that comes in is so important. Um, one of the biggest things, and you know, I hear this from clients all the time, is we're responsive. Literally, emails are handled within minutes of coming in. You know, we have a response to somebody. Other than, you know, probably from 10 o'clock at night till 5 o'clock in the morning is the only time that we're not responding within, you know, a couple minutes. Um, so I think that's the first part is, you know, just getting a quote to the person, 
reaching out to the person, um, you know, within minutes of them reaching out to us. Um, yep. I've found that if it's a repeat client, they'll wait for you. Um, you know, if it's somebody you have a relationship with, they'll wait to the, you know, maybe until the next day, yeah, but yeah. a new client isn't going to wait for you. They're going to, you know, keep calling around, keep emailing until they get a response. Um, from that, uh, if they don't book on the spot, we do follow-ups. So if I email you today and I don't get a response, I'm emailing you again tomorrow. If after that I don't get a response, then I'm calling you tomorrow night. So we really have like a two-day process where we'll continue to email and continue to call until we feel like we've made every effort to, you know, get a response from the customer. The response may even just be, yes, we received your email. Thank you. We need to talk to the rest of our group, but we want to do everything possible to make sure that we put a quote in that customer's hands, you know, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Okay. So I love that. So again, so uh, let's say quote request comes in, you follow up um, like as soon as possible and do you, you typically follow up with like a phone call or just an, uh, send an email quote or text message or what do you typically do? So I typically try and respond to them in the way that they've contacted me at okay. first. So if they've emailed me, I email them back. If they've called me, I call them back. If they text me, I text them back. But if that method doesn't produce results, then I'll flip. So if I email somebody twice and they're not responding to my email, then I'm going to pick up the phone and call them. Then I might send them a text. So I feel like that I want to be respectful in the sense that maybe they are at work and can't get phone calls. So if they've, you know, emailed me, I want to start by emailing them back. But you know, again, if I can't get a response, I'll keep going. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I love that. And I think, uh, I had Nina, I spoke with her a few weeks back on here, and uh, I think she had, had mentioned she does something similar. And so the quote request comes in, you get back to them right away, immediately. And um, <clears throat> now if they don't respond to you, you follow up with an email the next day? Yes, so we follow up with an email the next day just saying, we want to make sure that you've received the quote below. Will this option work for you? If we have additional questions, we might put those in there. Um, that generates, so we do that every morning. So say we're in a morning, say I'm doing 50 email follow-ups. Probably oh from those 50, I'll you get another. You don't really have that many. I'm sorry. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> so, we really have that many. Um, so this morning, I think I actually did it this morning, and I think I did probably 50 email follow-ups. Wow. Of those 50, 10 probably responded and said, yes, I got the quote. Um, I have additional questions. Um, you know, you'll get, this is out of my budget. You know, I had no idea how much a limo cost. Um, but that's still a response. And it's still a response that I can work with because then I can say, well, what about an SUV? What about a van? It opens the line of communication to say that, yes, you know, a limo might be out of your budget, but perhaps we can look at some other options, smaller time frames. So, I mean, my goal is just to get them to engage because I feel like the, the more I can get them to engage, the better chance I have of earning their business. 100%. Yeah, I'm sure there's a direct correlation, right, with how many. So you're just looking for a response. And typically that email you send is relatively short, right? It's the second email. I mean, the first email that I send is long. You know, it has a link to our vehicles. It has a customized quote. It includes, you know, that we offer red carpet treatment. You know, it puts it all out there. The second follow-up email is very short. Um, I found with follow-up emails, I've done it all different ways. For us, it definitely works better to be one or two lines. I feel like the client can read that quickly. Um, you know, you're not sending them paragraphs. Yeah. Um, and then if I still don't get a response after that second email, then my evening staff comes in and calls everybody. And a lot of times um, it's surprising that tons of people say they still didn't get the quote. So the phone oh. call is really, really important. You know, if they're emailing from a job email, we may get filtered out. Um, you know, somebody that gets a lot of emails, it's busy during the day, may just miss it. So even after emailing them twice, we still, I mean, every day, we still get people saying, no, I didn't get the quote. So at that point in time, we verify the email with them. 
we give them a verbal quote and then, you know, we resend it to their email. Maybe they give us a different email. Um, but we've really, really found success in the multiple contacts. Some people don't like it. Um, you know, some of the people hang up on you and, you know, the office staff, they just write hung up on <laughs> and that's okay. You yeah. know, um, I don't feel any guilt in, I don't feel like I'm harassing people. I don't feel like I'm overselling. They contacted me. So I feel like um, asking them to respond isn't being pushy by any means. Oh, no, 100%. And I think that's what a lot of operators get caught up on, that they're maybe being too pushy. And look, if they haven't given you a yes or a no, you know, you're just doing, you know, you, you, if you want to stay in business, if you want to grow, you know, you need to get a yes or a no. And I, I think that's the trouble a lot of these operators have is they, they, they never follow up after that initial quote request. And so you typically follow up, uh, it sounds like twice. So you email the following morning, like a short little one line email. And then if they don't respond to that email, then your night staff, follows up with a phone call. And so I love that idea. So is that typically later in the afternoon that they, your night staff gets in that they? Yeah, the night staff gets in anywhere between four and five. Um, and then they'll do their phone calls in the evening. Um, once we're at that point then, I mean, we're still not done. <laughs> um, you know, if the client hasn't told us to leave them alone that they're not interested or they haven't booked, I mean, we continue the follow-up process um, we'll reach back out again in about a week. Um, and then after that, they just kind of go into a file that we follow up with every month because we are dealing with a lot of special events. You know, a lot of times it is events that are farther out. So yeah. somebody that's inquiring about a wedding, they might not be ready to book sometimes six months, a year. I mean, it's not, it's not unusual for me to, pull out a lead that I got from your marketing that I got over the summer. That's now just calling to book. We're seeing that a lot with New Year's Eve where people start thinking about New Year's Eve months and months in advance. And I have this pile of leads that I've, you know, compiled for the past year. And now they're finally ready to, you know, get serious, start booking. Um, so, I mean, for me, until the event date has passed, the follow-up process doesn't stop. Nice. I love that. Now, as a percentage, because I know you track everything and you can right. probably at least give me a ballpark. How many would you say, what percent, you know, you give them a quote that day, they're like, all right, let's do it. And then what percent, and I know this is going to vary whether it's a wedding client or an airport transfer, but just generally, what percent would you say you close on the initial, the first day? And what percent would you say is on after one of your follow-ups? Um, I would say probably initially we close 15 to 20% the day that they inquire. Oh. Um, and you know, like airport people, that's typically not as hard of a sell. You know, they're, yeah, yeah. they're usually ready to book. Um, the rest, I'd say probably another 15, you know, or so percent, then it takes them a week. And then probably another 15% or so, you know, it takes them a month or longer just because, you know, it is more people may be involved in the decision making process. You know, when you're talking about a 30 passenger bus, you know, party bus, when people are going out for the night and there's not one person footing the bill, that's, yeah. you know, 30 people that you have to get involved to agree to pay a certain price. So things like that just naturally take, you know, a little bit longer. Yeah, 100%. Wow. Okay. So yeah, that's not a very, I thought you were going to say like 50% book right away. So no. that's another thing I just want to kind of emphasize that just because they don't, you know, give you an answer, you know, on the first day right there, it doesn't mean many times, and, and I'm guessing, and you know this, most of your competition probably isn't following up like you are, which makes it great for you, right? Right. <laughs> because, absolutely. And and these two, you have to figure the clients that I'm getting from, you know, what we do together, they're not clients that I have a relationship with. So, you know, they're not necessary. They haven't used my services before. They don't know about our vehicles. They don't know about our pricing. So it, it does take a little bit longer. Um, you know, I have to prove to them that, 
you know, we have great customer service, you know, I have to earn their business. And sometimes that takes more than, you know, a five minute phone call. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, you know, I can prove to them that, you know, I'm going to answer their phone calls, you know, as many times as they call, I'm going to respond to their questions, you know, and I'm just, I'm working to build the trust, to build the relationship. And I'm fine that, you know, in some circumstances that takes months to earn their business. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Awesome. Now, do you, do you guys use like a, a, I've listened to a ton of your calls, obviously. Right. And one thing I've noticed is, uh, I'm guessing you guys have some sort of a script. Um, all of your sales staff, they're all really good on the phone. And so do you like train them personally? Do you provide a script or what do you, what do you um, do with that? I don't, I'm not the initial trainer. So I have, um, actually she's in her sixties. Um, she does my training for me. She's so patient. Um, she trains everybody for about a month. Um, we do use scripts. So they actually have, you know, they get, I, this is what I should say on this type of phone call. They get fill out forms. So if it's a wedding, it, you know, walks them through step-by-step step what questions to ask. If it's an airport run, it walks them through step-by-step step what questions to ask. Um, once she's done training with them, then I spend time with them. Then I actually have them come in and shadow me because I still do things a little bit different than everybody mm -hmm. else. And I really want them to see how I do things. And I also want to see how they're learning so I can, you know, correct bad habits. I can offer up, you know, an alternative way to say things. Um, so, you know, we, we all, um, you know, every senior person in the office to a degree is training new people. Um, I have a new person that I hired, I guess she's been around since like September. I mean, I still don't let her work alone, <laughs> you know, so she's still working alongside of, you know, a senior staff. So, I mean, and it is, it's a, um, I always tell people when I hire them, I'm like, you think it's easy. It's not easy. Like it's a, you know, just because we service such a large area, we have so many diverse, um, you know, vehicles, client types. It's not easy. I mean, it's, it takes, you know, six months at least to, to learn to, um, you know, to learn the sales process, to learn the pricing, things like that. Oh, I bet. Yeah. With all those different event types and each one has its own unique questions. I'm sure you asked now has your fleet, um, the makeup of your fleet, has it changed much in the past two years? Like a lot of operators are getting away from like stretches and all going to like limo sprinters and things like that. Have you, you know, added vehicles taken away? Right. I think that um, unlike most people, we have still stuck with our core of stretch limousines. Um, we have added party buses. We have added shuttle buses. Um, I think we're up to, I guess we have five party buses now. Um, we still have uh, eight stretches. Wow. And with, you know, we just bought, um, last month I just bought the new Mercedes Metro stretch. Um, which I'm hoping my client base <laughs> loves. I still feel like it's the wrong time of year to really test the market to know 100% how wedding people are going to react to it and things of that nature. And then I just bought a brand new Chrysler 300 stretch. Um, it's still what wedding people want. It's not to say that I won't, um, you know, have a wedding that wants a party bus, but pictures at a wedding are so important. And I think the bride still has that long white stretch limousine in her mind when it comes to pictures. Um, stretch limousines are very difficult. <laughs> um, <laughs> so from a mechanical standpoint that, you know, I wish we could switch to all party buses, you know, from a maintenance standpoint, it would be a thousand times easier. But right now our client base still really, really wants the stretch limousines. So that's, you know, I mean, we've added all of the other stuff so we can offer it all, but we've still really stuck to our core also. Got it, okay. Awesome. Now, um, so I remember, yeah, when we started two years ago and you were, we were doing, uh, you know, I was, I was trying out the paper lead model of switch sense, which I almost think it's almost a plus in a way that because you were really tracking everything and you needed to know down to the dollar, you know, and you're probably in the first few weeks, is this worth it? I'm not sure. But over time, did you see, okay, this makes sense, especially because I remember when I visited you at your location, you mentioned, I, you know, I have people from a year ago 
that are coming back because you know you don't throw those you know a lot of people they get a lead they don't get a yes or no they're like oh well they'll call back you you know keep following up and following up and so you might be landing jobs you quoted back in june you know um so did did you find it, it it took a while till you realize okay this makes sense this is this is working absolutely um i feel like it probably took like you said you mentioned 6 months it probably took 6 months for me to really capture how amazing product you know if we want to call it a product how amazing it was um but right off the bat i think the first week that we worked together i think the first or second day i landed two bus like corporate jobs one of them booked multiple buses so i mean from the beginning it was a no brainer but there were frustrations along the along the line and it just takes time because most of my clients don't book immediately it just took that stretch of time to you know, capture all of the sales, go back, you know, say on this day, even though I didn't book that much this day, when I go back six months later, I can say, oh, I actually booked several thousand dollars from that day. It just took time to work all of the leads. Um, the other thing that made a big difference with what we were doing together is because of where we're geographically located, Frederick being, you know, 45 miles outside of DC, outside of Baltimore, you know, I was targeting DC clients. Well, I couldn't be competitive in the short DC transfers. And that was super frustrating to me because I felt like I was paying for all these leads, but yet financially there was no way I could make it work. So what I've implemented since then to make everything work a little bit better is using local affiliates. So now I have companies that are located in DC that I use for those short transfers. Um, I still make a little bit of money off of it, but the important part is I've gained a customer. Yeah. So now already I might be subbing out their airport trans transfers because it's, you know, it may be five minutes from the airport in DC to their hotel. I can't drive 45 minutes for a five minute transfer and be competitive. But while they're in town and they want to go to dinner and they want to go on a tour of the monuments, that's the business now that I can capture. So, you know, I'm making a little bit of money on the other side, but then I'm capturing them as a client. So now every time they travel to DC, they're reaching out to me and they're using me for stuff, you know, that I actually can make money off of. Yeah, right. Or maybe they have a, a wedding or they know someone. There's just, there's a lot of value in that. Oh, you don't, and you don't see it right away, right? It right. takes time, but over time, you know, it, it, your business just starts growing. Um, and yeah, no, no, that's, that's a great, that's a great insight because I, I talk to a lot of even my clients and I'll listen to them on the phone call and they'll say, Oh, you know, sorry, that's, that's out of my service area. And you know, I'll have the talk of my, like, Hey, look, I mean, just, you know, if you have to try to find some affiliates and, and farm that work out, you know, when you're paying for marketing, you need to try to, even if you don't make anything and you just break even, maybe you've gained a client and there's value in that, right? A lot of value in that. Yeah. And so that's a great insight right there. I think Nina said the exact same thing um, as, as you did. And I noticed you guys are both very similar as far as like, you're like sales, 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 and you right. understand. And those are always, you know, my most successful clients. And typically you don't get someone who's good with numbers and good at sales, which, you know, that's a deadly combination. And then right. you throw in focus into the mix with no distractions. And I can see how you, you've probably grown a decent amount, you know, in the 13 years since you've been in business. How many vehicles um, are you at now? We have 30 vehicles right now. 30 vehicles. Wow. Okay. Awesome. And we probably, we probably, we have the work for more. Um, as everybody says, it's hard to find quality chauffeurs. Um, so I've really spent this past year growing affiliates. Um, I have amazing local affiliates that I work with. Um, I have a company in Montgomery County that I literally sub out party buses to them every single weekend. Um, I, you know, they're a great affiliate. I don't ever have issues with them. I still make a decent amount of money, but I don't have to pay, you know, for the vehicles. I don't have to deal with more chauffeurs. <laughs> so that's yeah. kind of where we're at right now is, you know, I've spent the last year kind of trying to grow the affiliate side versus 
buying more vehicles, hiring more chauffeurs. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you even need vehicles, right? Couldn't you just, <laughs> you know? That would be a dream one day. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Um, so what would you, what would you say to someone, um, uh, that's like considering, uh, potentially trying out, uh, you know, um, you know, my service, uh, limo marketer, when I was with you, when we started, I was branded as clicks profit. Uh, what would you say to someone who's thinking about, you know, starting doing some of their own, uh, hiring me for some of their marketing? Well, I mean, for us, it's been the best thing that's worked for us probably since I've owned the limo company. Um, it is something though that you have to be dedicated to that, you know, if you think that you're just going to pay the money and, you know, you're just going to have the customers without working it, that's not what's going to happen. The customers are there. Like you have given me the customers, but you have to work the leads. Um, you know, to me, it's a no brainer. Um, and I guess, you know, every market's a little bit different, but for us, um, you know, as many clients as you give me, like I will work the leads and sell them if at all possible. Um, you know, so it works with, you know, as long as you have an inside sales team, even if you're doing it yourself, because I do, you know, I still do a lot of it myself. I mean, I'm in the office every single day. I start doing emails at five o'clock in the morning and, you know, I do my last set of emails, you know, before I go to bed at nine or 10 o'clock at night. But as long as you're putting in the time, I don't see how it couldn't work. Yeah, no, I love that. And that's pretty much what I tell everyone now. It'll work, but there's a lot of work involved, right? Right. Especially when you're doing the kind of lead volume you're doing. How many, um, how many uh, full-time uh, sales staff do you have? Or I should say, uh, you know. Counting me, there's six people in the office. Okay. So we're open seven days a week, um, pretty much 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day. We stay a little bit later on the weekends, you know, during busy season if needed. Um, and it, you know, it takes six of us to, you know, manage 30 vehicles, all of the affiliate work we're doing, you know, to do all of the follow-up. Um, but you know, it makes money, so yeah. <laughs> it's worth it. Awesome. And, uh, I forgot to ask this earlier. Do you give any sort of incentive to your, um, to your, uh, customer service reps if they, if they like book a job or not? Absolutely. So we do two different things. Um, they actually get paid per job that they book. So they get $2 on top of their, you know, hourly wage for a job that they book. Um, and although like in the beginning you think, oh, what's $2? But, you know, if you sold 10 jobs that day, if you sold 20 jobs that day, you know, every day of the week that you're working, um, you know, their bonuses that go onto their checks, you know, can be a hundred, two hundred dollars a week without a problem. Um, so they get a per job. So, I mean, every phone call that comes in, every email that comes in, I want them to feel as much value, you know, as much importance as I feel at that, you know, phone call or that email. And I feel like that really helps create that. Um, and then the second thing I do is we do company wide booking bonuses, which are on a monthly basis. So say last month we did $200,000. Um, once we surpass that $200,000, then everybody gets a percentage of what we've surpassed it by. I, it's a complicated process, but I'm a numbers person, but <laughs> it's split up based on the hours that everybody's worked. So, you know, if somebody's worked way more hours than somebody else, then they get a bigger cut of the monthly bonus, but it's all about growing. It's all about selling. So the more that we can grow, the more that we can sell, I want, you know, my office staff to share in that. Yeah, no, I love that. So that's great. I, I don't think I've ever heard that before. So a bonus on every job booked, which I think that's a great idea. That's like an individual bonus. And right. then you also do like a, a kind of like a team bonus. Right. Exactly. So you, so you have both that, that, that's a great idea. If, if someone's watching this just for that tip right there is worth the whole interview. Um, Jennifer is obviously a wealth of knowledge. Um, you're, you're completely crushing it. Um, any advice or I guess my last question is this, what do you wish you would have known when you started the limo business? What do you know now that you wish you would have known when, when you first started? Um, I feel like that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> a million I've been, things. <laughs> I've been thinking about that. And I mean, obviously 
you know, a 13 years worth of knowledge from when I started out. I mean, I knew nothing. I had been, you know, I had driven and, you know, rented a limousine a couple times, but I mean, I knew nothing about the limousine industry. I knew, you know, the accounting side of owning a business. I knew sales because I had, you know, been helping my husband grow his business. But um, I think probably what I didn't do, which I would do differently, is to try and find friends in the industry, other operators, even if they're not in your area, because I was scared for a long time, you know, had been burned by a couple local affiliates that we had worked with. And, you know, so I, I shied away from, you know, and of course, Facebook groups didn't exist 13 yeah. years ago. But I think more than anything is, you know, having friends in the industry, having people that you can talk to, even if, you know, me being in Maryland, if I found somebody in California that, you know, we could share, um, you know, share stories, run problems by each other. Like, I feel like for a new operator that, you know, teaming up with somebody that, you know, has more knowledge than you, I mean, surround yourself with people who know more than you. And I mean, it, it, it does really, really help. Yeah. And then, so the other thing is I wish I was a mechanic. <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I'd w wish I'd gone to mechanic school maybe instead of accounting school, <laughs> but yeah. you know, that's over and done with, but <laughs> I'm guessing it's the, all the stretch limos you guys own. Uh, yeah. They require quite a bit of maintenance. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, you know, in the beginning I did it all. Um, not that I worked on the limos, but you know, was in charge of making those decisions. But now, you know, luckily we have a fleet manager that, Nice. that handles that side of it but and you're just focusing on what it is you do best which is you know the sales side of it That's absolutely awesome. okay hey jennifer again thank you so much for doing this um anyone who's watched this you, i'm sure has learned a lot um and you've had uh, congratulations on your success it's really incredible what you've been able to uh what you've been able to achieve so um thanks again for doing this and uh Anyone watching this, thank you for watching. And be sure to, um, you know, if you ever need, a, you're you're based in Fed Frederick, but you operate in Baltimore and Washington, D.C., correct? Correct, yes. Okay, and stretch limos, party buses. You don't do any larger vehicles, right? Or motor coacher, motor we coach? Have, we have shuttle buses in school. Oh, okay. Buses. Awesome. Well, Jennifer from uh, Touch of Class in Fred Frederick, guys. Uh, thank you so much again, Jennifer. and. Um, yeah, I'll see you around.